Hi, Hi Mark. Uh, and there's my picture. Glenn, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, the camera had me worried there for a second, but we're now we're ready to go. Also like to share my uh, uh, thanks to everybody for coming today. And Claire, um, it's great to see you. And uh, I wish we could be doing this in person, but I'm really looking forward to your probing questions about uh, FISRA. <laughs> No, thank you for having me. It's great to be here, as you said. Uh, even if it's virtual, it's great to hear that so many of us have, have gotten together this morning. We have a lot of ground to cover, but Mark, I thought maybe we could jump into things and I'd like to give you a couple minutes just to sort of introduce FISRA, you know, what you personally care about financial regulation and tell us a bit about what sets FISRA apart from its predecessor or predecessors. Well, sure. Yeah, thanks, Claire. Well, th th those are great questions. I'm going to take them to two pieces because First of all, is personal about why I do this and why I care about financial regulation. And the simple reason is, is that it actually makes a difference in the lives of everybody in Ontario. Business goal, our mandate is to protect the public as we work towards financial safety, fairness and choice for Ontarians. And while much of what we do is unseen, it, it's a big responsibility. We regulate sectors that are foundational to everybody's lives, pension plans, mortgage brokers, life and health and P&C insurance, auto rates, loan and trust companies, credit unions, health service providers, and soon financial planners and advisors. It's, it's busy. And our responsibility is to promote strong financial services sectors. And we take protecting the public interest very seriously while we seek competitive markets and innovation as mentioned by Glenn. And I take this role very seriously. The government launched FISRA in 2019 to be an independent and empowered regulator. We have a transformative mandate and where it enables us to regulate in a way that's open to business, to innovation, but dedicated to consumer protection. And our, our mandate has intentionally competing interests and we have to balance those. And so it's a bold new approach. And I think it's an approach that's making a difference. And wherever I go, whoever I meet, and I think about the work that we're doing, and the need to act in their best interests. We as, as pick, particularly, are, we care about those who have a position of vulnerability. You know, Claire, financial services, you, you know, you report on this, they're complex and they're changing a lot. And whether it's about the strength of an institution or the fairness of a, how they're getting services, consumers need somebody there to protect their interests and to, and to also make sure that the markets can grow and that they can function well. And so consumers, in every corner of the province, there are clients. We're dedicated to them and they deserve nothing less. And, you know, and that's what keeps me coming back into the office every day. I, I think you also asked me, didn't you, about, so what makes FISRA different than its predecessor? Do you want me right. to go into that for a second? Yeah. Yeah, because that's, so we merged with uh, two predecessor organizations in uh, June 2019. And I think FISRA is a different regulator. And some of it's because of the technical things given to us in the FISRA Act. We have a strong governance model with a great board of directors. We have rulemaking powers where we have a well-defined mandate and we've been given the powers to regulate the public interest. And because of this, we can regulate differently than our predecessors. And this is reflected in our mission. We want to be a dynamic, principles-based and outcomes-focused regulator that is serving the public interest. And we also have core values that they guide our actions internally and externally. Honesty, integrity, credibility, impact, collaboration, and empathy. And we've been in business two and a half to three years. Um, and as that, in that time, I think we've demonstrated that we have an efficient and effective approach to regulation that's proportionate and scalable. It's risk and evidence-based. As Glenn mentioned, we're a principles-based regulator. We look at the outcomes. We're moving away from prescriptive checklists and a compliance focus. We want to evaluate regulated entities by do they achieve the desired outcomes? This requires an understanding of why we regulate and good judgment, both by us and by those who regulate. And with principles-based regulation, entities are expected to understand and achieve the desired outcomes, but they can do so in a way, and this is the, this is the great part, that's suited to their size, nature, and complexity of the business and where they are in the marketplace. It's not one size fits all. So principles-based regulation, it's fundamental in everything we do, in our rules, in our guidance, our regulatory decisions, but it really comes to life in how we supervise the regulated entities. By using principles-based regulation, we evaluate whether the public good is furthered by their activities. FISRA, this also requires FISRA to really be action-oriented, and we're building the capacity to actively supervise regulated entities to assess 
whether those outcomes are achieved and the consumer interests are protected. Internally, of course, this requires significant cultural change, and that also requires cultural change in those who regulate. And this makes our emphasis on communication, collaboration and transparency all that more important. And you'll hear more about this in the panel on principles-based regulation. Something else that sets us apart, and Glenn mentioned this, is innovation, and we're going to have a great panel on that today. Our innovation office, it's there to help both new and existing market participants how to innovate in a responsible way, a way that protects the public interest and maintains consumer confidence. And earlier this week, our innovation office released the innovation framework, and we started our first, we call it test and learn environment for the auto insurance. This will help us validate and assess new and innovative products, services, business models that don't fit within the existing regulatory parameters to see if they can be introduced in Ontario without risk of public harm. And you'll hear more about this in the innovation panel. So, you know, all these differences, I think FISR is quite, quite a different organization than our predecessors, but, you know, our transformation is still underway. And I expect as we're guided by the engagement with our stakeholders, we're going to continue to grow and evolve to better serve the needs of our sectors and frankly to assist our sectors in making sure that they fulfill their role, which is providing competitive financial services to meet the public demands. Great. Well, thanks, Mark. I think that gives us a really good opening and, and an overview of, of what FISR is. And as you pointed out, there's a lot of sectors that FISR covers, and I hope we can dive in and get into some of them. Um, I, I want to jump into a topic that, that I've covered quite a bit. Um, and, and so the mutual fund industry is banning DSC mutual funds, deferred sales charges coming up on June 1st. And when we jump into the insurance sector, you know, FISR's regulation of segregated funds, which are somewhat similar to, to mutual funds, doesn't seem to align with the regulation of mutual funds on the matter of DSCs and cost disclosures. So I'm wondering, do you think these need to be harmonized for better investor outcomes? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, you know, and, and you, Claire, Claire, you, of course, cover this area and you write on it, so you know, but for those who might not be as close to segregated funds are a form of variable annuity. It's an insurance product, but it has investment features, and you're right, very similar to mutual funds. And segregated funds and mutual funds, they can be close substitutes to investors. They're often sold uh, by the same persons and even sponsored by the same fund managers. And so when we're regulating seg funds, um, we think about the competing objectives we have of protecting consumers and coordinating and collaborating with other regulators in Ontario and across Canada. And for seg funds, Similar to you, I think my starting point is that the protections for mutual funds and seg funds should be harmonized unless there's a product or market reason to diverge. Otherwise, we're going to open ourselves to regulatory arbitrage and to unfair consumer outcomes. The Canadian Securities Administrators, as you pointed out, are banning DSCs for mutual funds in June and because DSCs, they create a back end cost to exiting an investment unless the investment's been held for several years. And this is a barrier to exit and a cost for investors, particularly for vulnerable individuals that have to exit unexpectedly. And so FISRA, we're working through the Canadian Council of Insurance Regulators, I'll call them the CCIR, uh, to consider, is there a basis for distinguishing seg fund ESCs from mutual fund ESCs? And more broadly, how should we can think about seg fund sales incentives generally? And we're engaging with stakeholders on this. And so although seg funds are a multi-year insurance product, so there are some differences for mutual funds. It seems hard to justify a back-end sales charge to consumers that need to exit early. You know, but we are an evidence-based regulator. We're committed to consult consultation, transparency, collaboration. And so we want to make sure we have a found fa factual foundation, a sound factual foundation for this. And we're going to get stakeholder input. We're going to build a CCR consensus, and then we're going to make a decision. So I don't have something to announce today, but please stay tuned because I think you'll be seeing stuff soon about the appropriateness of seg fund deferred sales charges. Now, and, and I'm not sure you have the question. answer. Oh, sure. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just gonna I was jump gonna in to ask, and you may not have, I may not have the, the answers to this. I just wanted quickly on the on the timeline for that, because as we all know, in the mutual fund DSC situation, that took a very long time to get to a ban. So I'm just wondering if maybe you can, do you have a timeline at all of, of you know, where things could move along? I think you'll see action uh, through CCIR uh, in, in parallel with the mutual funds. 
Okay. Great. That's my hope. Okay. And now then on the cost, cost, cost disclosure. disclosure. Yeah. And so, you know, I think investors, seg fund or mutual fund, they're entitled to know what are the costs associated with their investments, both direct and indirect. And mutual fund investors, they currently receive disclosures about distribution cost fees that they incur. And, and I am sorry to say that segregated fund investors don't receive that. I, I personally find that uh, difference in disclosure is not acceptable. And I'm hoping that we'll be closing it soon. But on a bigger picture, CCIR and the, the CSA were working together on improving and harmonizing disclosure obligations for mutual funds and segregated funds with the goal of total cost disclosures, direct and indirect. And significant progress is being made on this for both products. And we're looking at, and matter of fact, we've been testing consumer uh, reactions to, to disclosure prototypes so that we can get a real sense of what will be most useful. Um, a joint consultation between CCIR and CSA on total cost disclosures, I expect that'll come out in the near future. And I think CCIR will soon be talking to the sector in a very formal way about the disclosure implements. Uh, elements and their implementation. So I, I see really good progress on that total cost disclosure front. Great. So we'll certainly stay tuned for for some movement on on those two things. Uh, jumping over to the mortgage brokering sector, you know, investors lost a lot of money with Fortress. And although times are good right now in real estate, you know, I'm wondering, you know, what has Fizzer done to make sure that mortgage investors won't lose money of their decline in values? Yeah, great question. And uh, so Fortress involved what we call non-qualified syndicated mortgage investments, NQSMIs, a bit of a mouthful. And, and those are complex. Um, they're commercial project development financing rather than single family mortgages, right? So there's a big difference. They're higher risk investments, they have higher return. And, you know, there's been a focus on this uh, by regulators and the media. And Fizzer, since our launch, we strengthen investor protections at the point of sale and during investment uh, and frankly what we've, we've done is we implemented right away that we're getting disclosure materials submitted up front we're reviewing them to identify and actively supervise against high-risk transactions we also put out guidance about what are the hallmarks of high-risk nqsmis that is transparent for mortgage brokers and for investors to understand where our concerns lie and we're also actively monitoring the conduct of mortgage administrators they're the folks who manage the NQSMIs and are supposed to be protecting the investor's interests. And so with these enhanced supervisory techniques, Fizzer has been able to identify high risk NQSMI transactions and deter them and, be, be, and frankly uh, stop the sale to unsophisticated retail investors before it happens. We've also used this information, we've identified existing deals that expose investors to risk of loss. And we've been able to proactively and quietly ensure that the outcomes are better managed to get more money back to the investors. Now, importantly, we've worked with the ministry and the OSC, and we've implemented a new regulatory regime when these complex syndicated mortgages are being sold to less sophisticated retail investors. Those deals have similarities to equity deals, and they should have similar investor protection. So we've transferred the responsibility for retail distributions of complex SMIs to uh, to the OSC last July, and that makes sure that they're treated on the same basis as other equity type investments. And then we stay in the business of distribution of NQSMIs to sophisticated investors, the sale of qualifying syndicated mortgages, and of course, overseeing the administration of all SMIs. But, you know, I also want to point out, it's not stopping there. We strengthen our regulation of mortgage administrators who handle uh, the mortgages on behalf of investors. They have requirements for improved disclosures. For example, they need to let investors know if events arise, which could affect the, uh, the performance of the mortgage and not wait until bad things happen. We've also reduced regulatory burden by working with government to create a pathway for sophisticated entities to invest in mortgages without the protections that were intended for less sophisticated retail investors. And we're working with the government to implement its EMBLA review recommendations including a separate class of mortgage broker licensing for private lending. So that we'll have a more efficient market and will better protect the consumer outcomes. You know, I think what we've done in the in this area actually shows that we're an effective regulator and we're proactively engaged dealing with a, you know, a problem that has been in the market for quite a while. 
what's the timeline around the new classes for the mortgage brokers that you that you just mentioned? Yeah, it's uh, it, it should be happening really there'll be a transitional period over the next couple of years, but this is something that has really happened uh, real time. Uh, and and frankly, it's very important to do that because the private lending is a different type of transaction. And this was identified in the envelope review by the government. And so we want to make sure that this new private lending class, it's there because you want to better protect the consumers and the investors who are engaged in that. And so we're going to have to have a transitional path um, where people who are already in the marketplace, where they have a chance to get this accreditation, and then we'll have higher entry standards for new entrants who want to come in and work in the private lending market. And so it won't affect people who are doing the more traditional vanilla mortgages. Those mortgage brokerages and agents can just continue with business as normal. And for those who want to engage in this more complex private lending, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of extra burden for them. But, you know, we're, we're really pleased with the response. The whole profession has been very supportive of this. They realize that that extra recognition of private lending as a distinct category of services is important to them and important to both the consumers and the investor public. Right. I see a lot of questions coming coming into our Q&A, and I just want to remind everyone they are able to to message in your questions. We're going to try to get to them at the end uh, and, and I can see them popping up. So we'll, we'll definitely jump over to those uh, later in the session. Um, so so jumping into a, another area that, that I've covered as well is on financial planners and advisors. Um, you know, a lot of people, myself included, but a lot of financial firms have in the country have been watching Ontario around the regulation of individuals who are using the titles of financial planner and financial advisor. And earlier this month, FISRA did send the final rule proposal to the Minister of Finance uh, for approval. So I, I want to sort of reach out and ask you, you know, is, the, is this financial planner and advisor title protection framework, it, you know, covers a lot of people who are already regulated in the industry. So with this new rule, is it going to cause additional burden on the industry? Is it going to be duplicate oversight for advisors? And secondly, um, you know, why aren't the SROs like the MFDA and IROC being given exemptions for the, the duplication? Yeah, great, great questions, Claire. You know, to step back just a little bit, right now in Ontario, anyone, regardless of their skills and without being subject to supervision, can offer themselves to the public as a financial advisor or plan. It's not reasonable to expect consumers to distinguish between qualified and well-supervised finance professionals and those who aren't. You know, we wouldn't expect consumers to evaluate medical doctors or other regulated professions on their own. It's a long-standing consumer problem, and this government has tried to address it through the Financial Professionals Title Protection Act. And so it's been given to FISRA as a principles-based outcome-focused regulator to work to achieve this act's objectives, reduce consumer confusion over titles and improve consumer protections by creating minimum standards for, this for these titles. And to achieve that objectives, we wanna make sure that there's consistent minimum standards around things like who's qualified, their conduct, how they're supervised and what discipline they're subject to. And so to achieve this regulation, but still to minimize burden FISRA's implementation will leverage existing frameworks for licensing and designating bodies for financial professionals. We're going to reuse the existing license and designation, and that avoids creating a new requirement for professionals who are within one of these approved credentialing bodies. The contemplation is going to be several licensing and designation designating entities that are going to come forth and be credentialing bodies. Those bodies have to apply if those entities apply to become a credentialing body and they'll get approvals that their licenses or designations will grant the right of title use. And once they're approved, their financial service professionals can use the titles which are approved without any disruption and without any new regulator supervising their activities because they're already subject to the supervision of these designation or licensing entities. And so when I look at this, I think this actually is a simple solution and it leverages existing regimes. And because of that, there's no need to grant exemptions because if an existing licensing or designation granting entity wants to have its people use the title, it just needs to come and apply to be a credentialing body. If, and the reason for that, we want to make sure everybody is inside is that's how you get consistent standards for key requirements such as education, 
codes of conduct, supervision, complaints, discipline. And you also want to make sure that, because now we're going to have multiple ways that someone can get the right to use the title. We want to make sure that title users who fail in those minimum requirements are held accountable and that the public will be protected from them going to another source of using the title and going to market. Now, if we granted exemption, we wouldn't get that consistent minimum standards that are associated with the right to title use and the ability to make sure that title users who don't meet standards cease activity and that we can protect the consumers. So we've submitted the rules, as you mentioned, to the minister's office. I know there's many competing priorities and objectives, time's scarce, but you know, I'm optimistic that FISRA will soon have the opportunity to implement this important public protection. And 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 just to finalize, is the, the credentialing bodies, have, have they been a, a approved or is this something that will come after the minister's approval that we'll then hear about who is going to be the, the credentialing bodies for these titles? Well, until the, the legislation is in force and our rules are, we don't actually have, um, you know, we have the ability to sort of do some preparatory work for the legislation coming in, but we can't approve credentialing bodies really until we actually have that legal frame to do it. But I am pleased to say that there are several um, entities that are already in active discussions with us about their applications. And so, you know, we think that this is going to be real and people are going to be ready to go, um, you know, hopefully uh, later this spring. Great. And, and just to, to follow up with that, to keep with the best investor protection standard, is there a fiduciary standard for financial planners and advisors under this new framework? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the, the, the regime, as I talked about, it gives FISRA the power to oversee the credentialing bodies. FISRA does not become the regulator of conduct of the title users. And that's because we want to avoid a duplicate regulatory regime and additional burden. Um, but, you know, the, that actually works because these people are already subject to oversight. And so what we're trying to do is to make sure that they will have consistent regulation across all the title users by having those minimum standards. And so because this isn't a vehicle for FISR to impose new conduct standards, which go beyond the existing norms established by securities regulators, what we're doing is we're making sure that there's a requirement, a flexible requirement, and our proposed rules have this, that if you want to be a credentialing body and you want your people who you approve to be able to use the titles, you're going to have to meet certain requirements. Title users will have to deal with the requirements as right in our rule, competently, professionally, fairly, honestly, and in good faith. There'll be requirements for codes of ethics, professional standards, and education requirements. And there's also a requirement for effective processes to deal with complaints and to discipline title users. And so this will allow us to reflect the existing consensus of security regulators on what is the fair treatment of clients and make sure that all the people who use the title will be subject to that minimum standard. And the great thing is, Claire, if securities regulators evolve, for example, that they go to a full fiduciary standard at some point in time, we'll then have the flexibility through this framework we've created to elevate the requirements for the credentialing bodies so that then all the titles title users will have to follow that new standard as well. So I think this really is a good flexible regime that will put the, the minimum protections across and evolve as securities regulators want this to evolve. Great. Uh, so, so jumping over to another sector that FISR covers is under credit unions. Um, and, and obviously one of the larger regulatory issues that arose in this sector was around PACE credit union. Um, you know, PACE credit union has been in administration since 2018 due to failed governance, mismanagement, and misconduct by its former leadership, primarily related to new business activities. Um, so, so I'm wondering uh, two things here. You know, the government does have a pending credit union act, uh, the CUCPA 2020, that is going to give credit unions even more room for business growth. So, so one, I'm wondering if you can give us an update on where things stand with Pace Credit Union. And secondly, is FISRA comfortable with the credit unions having this additional flexibility? You know, how are you going to safeguard for similar occurrences happening in the future? So maybe you can jump well, off thanks, with Claire. Pace because I threw a few questions at you. Yeah, so, so Pace, that's the quick one. So Pace Credit Union, it continues operations and it's serving its members' interests. Um, I can't comment, there are continuing litigation matters and I also can't comment on strategic alternatives, which may be under consideration. 
Uh, but I am pleased to note um, late last year, um, there was successful resolution of the claims by PACE members concerning the securities distributed by its now insolvent subsidiary, PACE Securities Corporation. So that's important progress on that front. Um, as to your larger question, so about opportunities for credit union growth. This, I always go back to our mandate. Our general mandate about includes fostering strong, sustainable, competitive, and innovative financial services sectors. And our credit union mandate says we have to contribute to the stability of the sector by considering the need for credit unions to compete effectively and take reasonable risks. We have a role, therefore, in managing prudent growth. And I have considered the CUCPA 2020 and the additional opportunities for new business and investments. With this flexibility, credit unions may expose themselves to additional risk. And that's why we've developed proposed new rules on sound business and financial practices, capital adequacy, and liquidity reporting and adequacy. These new, new rules, they're principles-based and outcome-focused, and they set requirements that will, re that will mean credit unions will have enhanced risk management and governance practices. Practices more closely aligned with the international best practices, and very importantly, practices that equip credit unions to prudently expand their businesses and to manage new risks. Credit unions will only be permitted by us to take on new business and investment activities if they can show the risks are prudently managed. In reviewing the proposed activities, we'll assess whether the credit union has strong enough risk management capabilities to effectively identify, evaluate, monitor, and mitigate significant risks. You know, also over the next year, we're putting in place a new risk-based supervisory framework for credit unions. This is a new approach. It includes our new risk data initiative, and it'll enable us to focus on the areas of highest risk in individual institutions. So we can better understand the risk profile of credit unions, so that we can identify issue of concerns and deal with them proactively. So overall, you know, given the increasing sophistication of credit unions and these new frameworks for managing and supervising risk, and given the need for credit unions to serve their members and to offer choice in financial services, I'm confident that it's prudent to move forward. I think another area just to touch on with credit unions is right now, you know, they, they are heavily exposed to residential mortgages and FRISA, FISRA put out mortgage guidance um, that some are saying that it's easier on credit unions than offsees uh, B20 guidance to the bank. So are you concerned that credit unions are overexposed to residential mortgages? Um, and, and will you regret being more lenient if housing prices start to decline? You know, the protection of credit union members' deposits and the stability of the sector and high standards of business conduct are all things that we care about as part of our mandate. And you're right, residential mortgage lending, it's more than half of the credit union loans. So it's really important that there's prudent practices and procedures to manage that risk. And it's also important that borrowers be well equipped to take on the debts they incur. That's part of conduct. And so our residential mortgage lending guidance you mentioned, it released a year ago, it, it carefully balances enabling credit unions to earn returns, meeting their members' home purchasing needs, and ensuring that members, depositors, borrowers, and the credit unions are not put at unnecessary risk. This guidance is principles-based, as opposed to some more prescriptive approaches that have been adopted in other jurisdictions. This considers that credit unions exist to serve their members. They're not there to generate a profit for shareholders, so there's greater alignment of interest. And credit unions have close ties with their community, and they should have superior knowledge of their members. So we have a diverse credit union sector. Some are quite large, and some are you know, more limited in serving a more focused community. And so a one-size-fits-all approach, it's not optimal. A principles-based approach sets out the desired outcomes and requires good processes customized as opposed to specific thresholds and metrics. This enables credit unions to determine the most effective means of achieving these outcomes. And it avoids arbitrary thresholds and metrics that may not be situationally appropriate. So let me give you an example. When assessing debt service coverage, now that's an important aspect of lending, rather than applying a specific debt service stress test that credit unions uniformly apply and say yes or no. We expect credit unions to determine and to be able to explain to us 
what are the appropriate debt service levels to protect the credit union against loss and also to protect the, its borrowers against being financially overextended. I think this regulation of residential mortgage lending, it should permit credit unions to serve their members well, to compete effectively, and to take reasonable risks. And given its importance though, we of course will continue to proactively monitor the mortgage lending processes and risks. But after a year's experience, you know, I can say that I'm comfortable with this lending activity in credit unions. Great. Thank, thanks for the answer. I feel like we could probably spend a whole lot of time on credit unions, uh, but unfortunately with our time, we're, we're going to jump over to the auto insurance sector. Um, clearly an area that is a hot topic with many Canadians. It affects 10 million consumers that are required to purchase this product in order to drive on the roads. And during the pandemic, there's been a, reports of windfall profits by auto insurers in Ontario. Uh, so what is FISRA doing you know, during the pandemic as this virus continues on to protect the consumers from these unreasonably high rates? Well, you know, we closely monitor what drives auto insurance costs. And frankly, we report now we've added public reporting on how cost benchmarks, the drivers of costs and rates are changing. And so during the pandemic, you're right, there was an unprecedented drop in the number of collisions and claims, partly offset by some increased accident severity. And as rates are always set on a forward-looking basis, these lower costs resulted in higher than usual auto profits in 2020. And this may continue in 2021. Now, FISRA observed this trend while it was happening and we took action. We established a use and file emergency rate reduction framework in 2020 to enable auto insurers to voluntarily and quickly provide consumers with immediate rate reductions. We also used existing regulatory tools to support relief and worked with government to confirm that non-discriminatory rate rebates could be used to provide consumer relief. FISR also, on the other side, was actively engaged with insurers to assess, to assess what consumer relief should reasonably avail, be available by each insurer. And we worked to encourage insurers to provide and maintain rate reductions and other consumer relief. Now, using all these pathways, insurers made more than a billion dollars in consumer relief avail available through rate reductions, rebates, and other means. And, you know, as rates are also set prospectively, policyholders who renew at a lower emergency rate continue to pay that lower rate for the balance of their term. So profits may be high, that's a matter of opinion, but FISRA, we don't approve or regulate profits. We approve rate filings based on historical data, and when we give the approval, then insurers can use that to set rates for future years. Now, we do have guidelines. They permit insurers to include up to a 5% profit provision in their pricing, but the actual profit, which is the common vote windfall, is a function of profit and loss. And the truth is, ultimate costs won't really be known for several years because of the nature of injury claims. Finally, you know, while this trend may not continue indefinitely, you know, I'm very pleased that it has been widely reported from multiple sources that Ontario insurance rates declined materially in 2021, including declines on average across the province and in many big markets like Toronto and Brampton. Another uh, topic in, in the auto insurance sector is around consumers who can be harmed by insurers who are not offering contracts to eligible consumers. And I know you sort of mentioned in your opening around some things in, in the auto sector, but you know, consumers can be hurt. There's arbitrary underwriting rules, such as a postal code that can, can impact them. And it increases the price without really reflecting risk. So, you know, what is FISRA doing to ensure fair treatment of consumers when they're, when they're shopping around for their auto insurance? Yeah, a great question, Claire. And auto is always, of course, a you know, it hits everyone who is, a, you know, over 10 million people have auto policies, so it, it hits us all. And, you know, we are committed to strong consumer protections related to auto insurance. We want to make sure that insurance is available to eligible consumers, that rates are just and reasonable, and that underwriting rules are fairly applied. Now, we monitor complaints closely, we look at market practices, and we try and identify, is there consumer harm going on? If so, we want it remedied, and if not, where we will take enforcement action. So you referred to a particular practice, which we identified in the marketplace through surveillance and targeted examinations. 
and, it, and we observe that insurers and their distribution representatives may not be honoring their obligation to offer auto insurance to all eligible consumers at the lowest available rate. This obligation is called the take all comers rule. Now this is a hidden harm because consumers are likely not aware that, that there was an absence of a quote from an insurer that may have given them the benefit of a lower rate. It's an example of how FISRA has to be that voice for consumers where they can't see what's going on because of lack of transparency. For example, insurers, there's examples of them not offering coverage uh, uh, to, uh, to renewal customers, to auto only customers where they don't have home included, to consumers who had an accident, to consumers resident in certain locations, or to consumers that just have short histories of obtaining insurance. Another example of the breach of the take all coverage rule is, is withdrawal of authority from, a, from brokers and agents, and then the insurer not responding with a quote on a timely basis on its own. So of course the insurer, the customer then just goes off and chooses from the quotes that are on the table. On November 15th last year, we issued take all covers guidance. We reiterated that auto insurers are required by law to provide all Ontario consumers with timely auto insurance quotes and the lowest quotes available to them. This includes the obligation to accept all business that meets the insurer's FISRA approved underwriting criteria. And while some of these breaches you know, may have been inadvertent uh, or an attempt to reduce insurance fraud, which is an issue, FISRA is actively supervising insurers on this issue. We're requiring them to review their practices. We're requiring them to report on this review later in 22 and to establish remediation plans for any practices where there are breaches. Now, with respect to the, you also asked about auto insurance rating territories and the use of postal codes as part of that. Now, this has actually been in the law for years and insurers are required to set rates using territories. Traditional rate setting requires objective factual criteria, such as geographic location, so that you can distinguish between risks based on claims experience. My suggestion for consumers who believe that their driving behavior justifies a lower rate and that they're getting a higher rate just because of some of those factors like geographic location, I urge them to look at user-based user insurance, we call UBI. UBI is offered by quite a few insurers now. It uses modern technology to assess actual driving behaviors, not just based upon criteria which you fit into different pigeonholes. And then it adjusts your rates accordingly based on your actual driving behavior. It's also important from a safety point of view because drivers learn more about unsafe driving practices. You know, we're, this is all part of a bigger topic. We recently released guidance um, to auto insurance companies. We want them to be aware of how we want them to approach rating and underwriting errors. They need to identify and to resolve those errors and importantly, to remediate any consumer harm. The final thing I'll mention is, you know, our work to protect insurance consumers are taking up one more level. It includes the proposed principles-based and outcomes-focused rule on unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Once in place, this rule will better equip FISRA so that we can protect insurers from a broad range of unfair conduct. So, so just on, on the UBI with the, with the drivers, I just want to ask, so is that something drivers have to ask the, the auto insurance for themselves or do they have to sort of seek it out online or it's just they have to go to their insurance companies and say they, they want to adjust their rate with this technology yes it's it's a different form of policy so that your rate be set and you and uh, in many of them you actually you know they'll get experience and you know it's just it's some i think use devices in your car some i believe can actually even use your own cell phone and it measures your actual driving behaviors and so that's why i say it has great safety benefits because you can learn the things you're doing that actually may be, you know, exposing you to unnecessary, you and your family to risk. Because, you know, it, of course, the insurance is important to protect against financial loss. But really, the most important thing we should all be seeking to do is to reduce the harm that happens on the road from unsafe driving. I'm just going to jump over to one of our audience questions because I see it sort of pop up on my screen and it has to do with the auto insurance sector. So I figure why not pop it into to when we're on the topic. Uh, but someone, you know, Mark, you mentioned balancing competing interests in your opening remarks. Could you expand on how FISRA does this, say, for example, in the auto insurance sector? 
I'm sorry, balancing competing risks in the auto insurance sector? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, it you know, it's it's in several different respects. So we have a mandate to protect consumers from uh, unfair business practices. And so we are constantly looking at that. And so there's a sort of a whole area of conduct regulation to protect um, auto insurance consumers. Importantly, you know, we're not a, a complaints resolution bureau where someone has a problem with their contract. Sometimes there are contractual disputes which need to go through ombudsperson processes. Um, and we look at those though, the complaints to try and understand, are there patterns of behavior? Ultimately, as a you know, risk-based regulator, we wanna actually understand what are the processes within insurers and in their distribution channels that either protect in consumers from unfair outcomes or are resulting in practices that result in unfair outcomes. So that's on the conduct side. On the rate setting side, where we approve, you know, we approve rates when the when, uh, insurer wants to change and we look at their underwriting criteria, there, there are legislative standards, just in reasonable rates. There are underwriting criteria which are approved. And so then we basically look at rate filings and underwriting um, criteria applications, and we make sure that we're balancing those interests. So overall, both on the conduct side and on the auto rate side, we're constantly trying to find what is the right balance from having a competitive, strong, sustainable auto insurance and PNC insurance sector, while making sure that we're protecting those legitimate consumer public interest. Great. So jumping over to pensions, you know, again, another sector, as we mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, there's a lot of different sectors that FISR oversees and pensions is uh, one of the last ones we're going to touch upon. But, you know, pensioners have lost a lot of money through underfunded single employer pension plans with failed sponsors like Nortel or Sears. So other than relying on the pension benefits guaranteed fund to mutualize losses with strong pension plans, you know, what is FISR doing to protect pensioners in from losses if their employer fails in those single employer plans? Yeah, yeah it's a great question. And, and it's right in our mandate again, we're required to protect the rights and benefits of pension plan members. And that means more than relying on the PPG app to top up benefits if a plan's insolvent. Members in a underfunded single employer pension plan become creditors in their employees' insolvency. And our goal is to protect their interests before the insolvency occurs. We observe that there are poor outcomes for plan members when they're underfunded and their employer is insolvent. Because of this, we implemented our actively monitored supervisory approach almost two years ago. This act of monitoring focuses on pension plans where we're concerned about the security of the pension promise due to some combination of underfunding and the employer's financial weakness. We utilize predictive tools, things I learned at OSFI, uh, to conduct a quarterly risk assessment of all PBGF eligible plans, including plan funding, employer financial health, proposed transactions, you know, things that might expose plan members um, as unsecured creditors to a loss if there's an insolvency. And so these plans are subjected to enhanced supervision and engagement. We have a specialized team at FISRA that does this act of monitoring. A key part of this is engaging in direct discussions and reminding pension plan administrators, such as the employer's board of directors, that they have a fiduciary obligation, a high standard to protect the interests of the plan beneficiaries. So, well, you know, our actively monitored work, these meetings are highly confidential. We've seen positive results with plan fiduciaries taking steps in several companies to reduce the risk to pension plan beneficiaries. They've done things like improve their governance, increase the plan funding, advance de-risking strategies, and use more conservative assumptions in assessing whether the plan members were at risk. And, you know, while there will be underfunded plans and insolvent employers in the future, we're, we're not gonna be able to stop that. This is a great example of FISR has quietly and proactively used our guidance and our supervisory tools to improve, improve outcomes for the people in Ontario. Great. And, just, and just following up on that with jointly sponsored pension plans, you know, they're also a huge part of retirement security. You know, what's FISR doing to make sure that, that they're well managed and that the, those investments are sound at the same time? Yeah, I mean, those large public sector plans you know, they are uh, a very important piece of what, what we have going on here in Ontario. And they're very large. Um, the largest ones is about 
half a trillion dollars in assets they manage or 60% of the pension plan um, assets in Ontario, 1.6 million people depend on them uh, for financial security. And going back to our mandate, I already mentioned that our, we protect the rights and benefits of plan members. Um, and that these plans sometimes have flexibility to what those benefits are. And solvency doesn't tend to be a big risk because they can often adjust benefits, remove inflation indexing, for example. But our mandate also requires us to promote good administration of pension plan. And that's an obligation that we take seriously with these large public sector plans. Now, they're sophisticated investors. You know, they're among the largest institutional investors in the world. In some cases, they transact globally and they're very innovative in their investments. And so while I don't have any specific concerns to share about our JSPPs or public sector plans, we're mindful that even large and apparently well-managed asset pools you know, the example of AIMCO in Alberta um, in the last few years is an example. Uh, they can have breakdowns in their risk management and governance that cause material investment losses. So we have been engaging our six largest public sector plans since our launch to understand their investment and risk management practices in targeted areas. We looked at their alternative asset risk management. Surveyed their practices, we compared them, and we released a report in 2021 on our findings. And we now have a benchmark to supervise in this area more actively. Uh, we're also piloting a liquidity coverage ratio, and this will give transparency and consistency on reporting and liquidity risk management. We'll get a better understanding of their liquidity risks and how they're affected by different investment strategies. And this can serve as a basis for stress testing, which is really important. We're also now starting to look at the broader investment risk management and governance practices. Now, while these plans have their own well-developed investment risk management, governance processes and controls, we want to look across them to form a view on best practices. We want to be able to identify ultimately whether we think a particular plan has good administration of its plan assets. Now, it's a short time we've been launched. This is complicated, um, but I think we've come a long way. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. And, but I do think that we're on the path to reaching a more mature state where we can better supervise these large public sector plans. All right, so, so pension plans, a lot of conversation has also been around like climate change and ESG. Uh, and, and so where does FISR come down on what pension plans should be doing to respond to the risks of climate change? You, you know, awareness um, among the institutional investors has definitely accelerated about ESG, particularly climate, uh, because it affects investment risks and opportunities. And pension plans, you know, the JSPPs, but all the single employer pensions, even the multi-employer pension plans, this is an important part of their standard of care that they have. They have a prudent investment investor obligation. And the plans and their fiduciaries, you know, they have an obligation, I think they know this, to ensure all risk and return factors are considered when looking at investment strategies. And so climate change specifically, you know, and ESG generally, they have to consider these risks. And we expect plans to look at these broader risks. It's part of their good administration ob obligation. It's part of protecting the plan assets that will fund the pensions. Now, given the long-term nature of pension obligations and pension investments, climate change risk is a particularly heightened risk for pensions when you compare it to other funds with a shorter perspective. Now, pension plan risk from a climate perspective is a derived risk. Plans don't produce a lot of carbon, but they do invest in many businesses and activities that can contribute to global warming. They also have the opportunity to invest in businesses that could help alleviate global warming. And this means that plans need to have because it's a derived risk, they need to have good, reliable, and consistent information on the carbon impact of different investments. Initiatives such as the Federal Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures and the work that's going on by securities regulation, regulators about disclosures, those are very important because that's how pension plans will be able to understand and manage this risk and potentially be a force to help us towards a greener future. We're also engaged with the Across Canada uh, CAPSA Committee of uh, Association of Pension Supervisors. Um, um, we're developing ESG guidance. Um, we're working on that actively. Um, and I, I'm hopeful that there'll be draft guidance later this year, which will be released for consultation so that everyone can see the thinking of all the leading 
pension administrators in the country. Great. So I'm going to jump over to, to some of our questions that are coming in. And, and as I'm scrolling through, uh, there's quite a few in there. Um, so forgive me if I don't get to all of the questions that we have. Uh, and then we'll jump back to, to a couple other questions that we have as well. But so so right now it says, um, what steps has FISRA taken to protect both public and private investors in the private mortgage space? So both public and single private investors in the private mortgage space. So I'm, I'm not quite understanding public investors in the private mortgage space. I certainly understand uh, single or private. So maybe what they mean is public in the sense of a pub, more public distribution where there's multiple investors. Um, so, you know, I go back to there's two big streams here. There's the non-qualifying syndicating mortgage investments. And there I've already talked about that we've done everything from proactive disclosures. And then we look at those substantively. Uh, we've identified what are the high risks in non-qualifying syndicated mortgage investments, and we proactively then manage those uh, offerings when they're in the marketplace. And we've also um, went out and worked where we've identified higher risk existing transactions to deal with the mortgage administrators to make sure that they're better managed for outcomes. So that's you know, the non-qualifying, and we have the Securities Commission for true retail offerings, where now they'll get the full protection of securities regulation. So I think on the non-qualifying syndicated mortgage investments, we're really in a much better place than we were two or three years ago. There are also the whole area of private lending and because financial institutions, because some of their requirements right now, it can be hard and high house prices, it's hard for people to get mortgages. So there is more and more activity where individuals are going to private lending alternatives. And the question I believe was about the investors in those private mortgages. And so there, yes, there are requirements. Um, I, I, I mentioned how we're actually going to credentialize and require a higher education and qualification level so that the people in mortgage brokerages who are putting these deals together, that they have enhanced um, knowledge and skills. We're also, as I mentioned, looking at mortgage administrators and we're, we're actively working to make sure that mortgage administrators understand their obligation because they essentially manage those investments on behalf of the investors during the term. And finally, you know, we're working with mortgage brokerages, particularly uh, where we have these private lending transactions and they're being, you know, sold individually or sold in groups or bundles to private um, investors. Those mortgage brokers have both an obligation to the borrowers who they're trying to get money for, but also to their investors. And that includes very importantly, making sure that it's a suitable investment for the individuals who are investing in those private mortgages. Great. And another question that came in, and they're not specific to when they say brokers, but I think they're talking about the auto sector. So it says here, will FISRA also investigate insurers canceling contracts with brokers because the brokers are quoting and writing policies for clients that the insurers don't want? Yes, this, this is part of the whole take all comers issue. Um, so, you know, it, it, if an insurer is using its market power, let's say because the broker is basically saying, no, um, I need to give a quote to this customer, and the insurer's preference is that they already have too much business from a customer in that geography or with that profile, and they don't want that quote to be given, um, that would be an improper practice for an insurer to use its market power and to cancel its brokerage arrangement because the broker is actually doing its job of trying to obtain the quotes and provide them to a consumer. So that is an example of a potential take all comer breach that we are expecting insurers to review their practices for. Um, you know, and obviously the, the, there may be anecdotal uh, issues we're aware of. And of course, sometimes the facts can be very complicated um, on a particular case because maybe the broker feels it's because they were trying to provide quotes the insurers didn't want. Maybe the insurer has a different perspective that the brokerage was not doing something else, which was required under the terms of their arrangement. But what we look for, more importantly, than those individual anecdotes and you know contractual problems, we're looking for patterns. And we're looking for, are insurers, are the distribution channels functioning properly? Do they have good controls and processes in place? so that important consumer protection rules like take all comers are actually honored in practice and, and because you actually have systems and controls to make sure that those are put in place. So a very important question raised. Okay. We're just gonna jump back to the segregated funds topic. 
Um, you know, so so we talked about the, the will it be similar to DSC funds. The other big thing that's happening in the mutual fund in, industry is client focused reforms. So is FISRA considering new market conduct standards for selling segregated funds similar to the client focused reforms that's happening in the securities industry? Yeah, a great question. Um, you know, we do actually care greatly about what goes on in securities, um, and we always look at that. Uh, securities regulation is, you know, very important part of the marketplace, and we always have to be careful that we don't just try to adopt what happens in the securities realm uh, with segregated funds because they are, of course, a, a different product. And so, the CCIR, since frankly before FISR was even launched, was working on this in this area, and uh, so there's good work from 2017, 2018. And we are not only want to build on that, but we're actually looking at the insurance distribution channels, including the role of managing general agents. And we're actually building supervisory capability about the life agents and how they deal with consumers on behalf of, of the, the insurers who create the products. And so our goal, we share this with the CCIR and um, some self-regulatory organizations. We want to have principles-based guidance that has clear expectations for insurers and their intermediaries that will cover the segregated funds throughout their life cycle. And then we want to be able to proactively supervise against that. And so, as I said, we look at the client folks reforms. They're not completely applicable to insurance because of product differences, but the goal is the same. It's about fair treatment. And so we want to make sure that insurance consumers are treated fairly when they invest in seg funds. And that it starts with how the products are developed, how it goes through the sale process, and then how it's managed through the whole product life cycle. It's a very important though, you know, one of our objectives is collaboration with other regulators. We wanna have harmonized rules for insurance products across Canada, wherever possible. It would be burdensome to insurers and distribu distributors have provincial variations. And it would also be confusing to consumers who won't understand the differences because they can be quite nuanced and frankly unfair to consumers if those differences operate to their disadvantage. So FISRA through CCIR, I expect we'll be consulting on segregated fund guidance this year. Um, this guidance should, you know, unless there are substantive reasons which we'll identify and discuss publicly, we'll try and bring se segregated fund client outcomes into alignment with the client focused reforms for securities. And then as we get that guidance in place, that then of course gives us that tool, that platform again, to actively supervise insurers and intermediaries. I mentioned the role of MGAs, our, our work on life agents, to make sure that their processes and controls and practices give seg fund investors fair treatment in Ontario. And just to confirm, you are meeting with other provinces in that, in that guidance. You're talking to other provinces about streamlining something. Great, yes. so jumping Absolutely. over to innovation. Technique. Sorry, yep. we have a bit of a delay. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I'm just going to jump over to another audience question um, around innovation. So FISRA recently released its innovation goals for the financial services sector and new pension related products have been popping up recently. So to what extent is FISRA looking to encourage innovation in the retirement security space? You know, it's a, it's a, that is a really great question. So. We actually just put out our innovation framework, um, and you know it 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 actually doesn't explicitly apply to the pension sector because the pension sector is a little bit different. It's not a for-profit sector. Um, it is part of uh, deferred compensation. There are fiduciary standards, um, but that isn't to say that our pensions are not innovative, uh, and that uh, other people in the marketplace are also trying to innovate to solve pension problems. And so I'll give you an example of that. And there is a, a particular fund that is out. It's uh, in distribution as a securities product, I believe is a mutual fund that actually tries to mutualize longevity risks. And so, as they say, this is the decumulation phase of your um, retirement savings. So, you know, that's a very important issue of how you mutualize that. And we're looking closely because that has some aspects of an annuity, a variable annuity and as of course dealing with pension risks. So we're very open and we are actually looking at this one product that I mentioned is in the market. We're in an active dialogue with other regulators who are involved um, and with the, the 
the promoter, the sponsor that created this, you know, important new innovation. Because we want to understand it and make sure that it's going to be offered in a way that's going to be safe, um, you know, for the investors that people can understand what they're getting from this product. So I think that, you know, there is a really important opportunity for in, you know, looking at some of these pension issues. As I say, there is a decline in defined benefit pension plans. You know, there's not many new ones starting, um, except for in the public sector, they have, the numbers tend to dwindle. And so with people then having their own defined contribution or group RSPs, that allows you to accumulate income, but then how do you manage it through your retirement? And particularly, how do you manage the risk that you could live to be 105 years old, or you, you might not be so lucky. Um, and so, you know, you just need to be able to find that. And so the mutualization of that longevity risk is a, is a really important issue. And I'm, I'm so glad to see that there is innovation going on. And our innovation framework, even though, you know, it, it uh, may not be targeted specifically at pensions, as I mentioned, it does outline that we have other tools. So we can use our discretion in certain ways. We have rulemaking authority. We could have discretion under rules. We could allow for trials to go on. So we're not here to basically to stop innovation. We actually want to encourage innovation, as we say in our framework, in a way that we can ensure is controlled and in the public interest. So if there's some pension, some innovators out there that think they have solution to pension problems, uh, Marlena, who you're going to hear from later at the innovation office, uh, you know, that she heads up, uh, she can't wait for your call. Great. So, so we are winding down our time here. I'm going to uh, give you sort of last words, Mark, on sort of where do you see FISRA in the future? You know, there's an upcoming election. Are you going to be asking for a bigger budget, more power? What do you see in store for FISRA? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I will say, you know, the, the elections, that's a political process and we just continue to do our job uh, in one way or the other. It doesn't, uh, that, that doesn't change what we do. Um, and our budget also, I should point out, Claire, um, we're funded by assessments uh, against the, the regulated sectors. And so those are sometimes fixed fees for a mortgage license or an insurance li agent license. Um, and the bigger sectors, they also pay on a variable basis based on the cost that we incur to support regulating them. So um, I'm not even concerned about uh, that from, because our, our discussion, although that budget, of course, is importantly subject to political oversight and ministerial approval, you know, that is something that we have been working out with the sectors and, and that's been going well. So your more fundamental question. So, you know, where's FISRA going to be a few years from now? So we're, we're a young organization. And we've made tremendous progress in our less than three years of existence, but we still have plenty of work to do as we grow and transform. You know, I hope, let's say five years from now, that our principles-based and outcomes-focused regulation, it'll be well understood and internalized across the sectors we, we, we regulate. And the reason why that's important is it'll get us away from prescriptive regulation and a compliance mindset. Our regulatory relationships can become more sophisticated and frankly less burdensome. Regulated entities, they'll be able to align with the outcomes that benefit the public that we're all trying to achieve. So you get better regulatory outcomes, stronger consumer protection, as the entities will be working in a way that is naturally aligned with achieving those public goods. I also hope three to five years from now, that our supervisory capabilities and our regulatory tools, the ones that are necessary to giving full effect to our mandate, that will be fully developed and will be less reliance on guidance and rules in one hand and on enforcement on the other, what I call the barbell, and that we'll have that strong middle as a respected, thoughtful, and well-resourced supervisor with tools and resources to fulfill our mandate in a variety of ways. I also think that, you know, five years from now, our involvement with consumers, because it's already continued to grow and mature so much in the last few years, the work of our consumer advisory panel, like a shout out to those people who volunteer their time and provide us great counsel. I think that work will broaden and deepen. And beyond that cap work, we'll also have increased consumer participation in our policy making agenda. Um, and we'll, our consumer research, which we're building the foundations now, I think that'll also give us a great uh, leverage point. And so, you know, we'll understand the public better because understanding the public interest is at the core of what we do and the public interest is incredibly diverse. And so that's really important to us, particularly for vulnerable consumers. 
I mentioned the innovation office. They're going to move from theory to practice. That means going away from supporting trials to supporting the introduction of new products and services. The, I think our framework will be revised, fully implemented, our test and learn environments that I mentioned, they'll be not only operational, but constantly evolving. And the test of innovation success, and I put this challenge for the panel coming, I think it's about, can we successfully bring down barriers to support innovation in the public interest so that we will see new financial products and services being offered to people in Ontario. You know, I also look at our a bit internal. We're a learning organization. We're constantly looking for ways to improve our processes and people. And that includes using information technology and data to modernize how we regulate. We call this FISRA Forward. In five years, we'll be fully utilizing our FISRA Forward technology to deliver regulatory efficiency through simplifying and fully digital operations a 360 view of regulated entities, case, content, and relationship management, and we'll have data analytics and enhanced client portals. I have a dream for this. Uh, it'll also allow us to redirect human resources to higher value added tasks or to reduce our fee assessments. Finally, culturally, we wanna be recognized, and I think we are today, but I wanna build on this, to be a place that talent people motivated to serve the public will want to work. I want them to come here because they know what we do in FISRA, it makes a difference and they want to be part of that success. So that's my Great, vision. And I'm getting, I, thank you so much, Mark. I'm getting the hammer on our time today. I appreciate we were able to get to all of the sectors that you oversee and it was a great discussion. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. Thank you, Claire. And uh, you know what, they were tough questions, but uh, uh, I hope this gave uh, uh, people a great insight into what we're doing at FISRA and our important work. Thanks for taking the time to come today.